in the space sciences. A foundational theory is the nuclear fusion model of the Sun and all stars. Nearly a century ago, with nuclear energy the sensation among scientists, Sir Arthur Eddington wrote The Internal Constitution of the Stars, in which he proposed that self-gravitating gas and inflating thermal energy explained how the Sun could shine for billions of years and not collapse due to its own enormous gravity. The concepts in this model have remained essentially unchanged for well over half a century. But how well has this model withstood scientific discovery? The list of solar phenomena that the standard model has failed to either predict or explain is astounding. And the mysteries only increase over time, defying all attempts to resolve them through conventional suppositions. Unbeknownst to the general public, an alternative, testable hypothesis of the Sun does exist. The Electric Sun Hypothesis, first proposed by engineer Ralph Jurgens, and more recently advanced by Australian physicist Wal Thornhill and Professor of Electrical Engineering Dr. Donald Scott, states that the Sun is not powered by an internal thermonuclear reaction. Rather, electric currents flowing in plasma along the galactic plane form and power all stars. If the Sun is in essence an electrical discharge phenomenon, then countless of the enduring problems in solar physics may finally be resolved. However, as the late Richard Feynman once said, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Over four years ago, the design of an experiment began that could change science forever. On June 27, 2015, attendees at the Thunderbolts Conference EU 2015 Paths of Discovery in Phoenix, Arizona will witness the premiere of the documentary film, Sapphire. The Sapphire Project is the first ever laboratory experiment to test a theory of the sun. Today, in this audio interview, Montgomery Childs, the director of the Sapphire Project, offers a brief outline of progress in looking ahead to his forthcoming report at the EU 2015 conference. There are two fundamental hypotheses, one which our team would consider to be the contemporary scientific position that the sun itself is thermal nuclear engine, that it's a kinetic model. And when we say kinetic, we mean that atoms are bashing together and they're under so much pressure that they develop fusion in the core of the sun. And then by some means or mechanism, this energy passes through the core out into the outer layers of the sun. And then we have a photosphere and then a corona and then the different type of phenomena that we observe with the sun, like corona mass ejections and the whole soup of elements that the sun produces. So there's the other hypothesis that says that the sun itself is driven by an electrical force. And that force itself uh, would be that the sun itself is a positively charged body in a generally negatively charged environment. Now, the principle behind the second I've written a few papers on this and presented them, and I boiled it down to charged plasma affecting matter of a different electrical potential. Now, thermal nuclear model of the sun is very different. It requires that the sun itself is, is standing alone and by itself. But further to this, there is no known method or mechanism or tests that have been conducted on Earth so far to obtain, well, obtain fusion, but to maintain ongoing and sustained fusion reactions. So that presents a bit of a challenge with respect to a testable model. It doesn't mean that the gravitational model isn't true, and it doesn't mean that it's absolutely false. Uh, our job, the SAFIRE team, our job, we were contracted to investigate the electric sun hypotheses. And I wrote a few papers on what I believe to be a viable or feasible uh, method by which we could test that hypothesis. Obviously, it's a simpler model in the sense that we have a charge differential. So what we've done is synthesized in a laboratory in a vacuum chamber, a positively charged anode, which in Latin is a solellus or small sun, in a generally negatively charged environment, which would provide the sun with electrons. Now, in any electrical circuit, typically you have a positive at one end of the circuit and negative at the other, and electrons flow from the negative, or you might say grounded state side, to the positive state side, and the ions flow in the other direction. And this is a very well-known process in plasmas. 
So based on Christian Berkland's work, on Crook's work, on Schmidt, Quinn, Fiorito, and many others that have worked in plasma over the last 100, maybe 120 years, I examined these models and came up with a design that I thought would be promising with respect to testing this model. A couple of years ago, I presented this experiment using modern technologies to go in and measure and diagnose the mechanisms, the process. Now, why that's important is because the work that we're doing in Sapphire is not what is called qualitative. In other words, we're not only just taking pictures and saying, gee, this looks like the sun. Because in the core of Sapphire, when we let it up, it looks very much like the sun. Its behavior is very much like the sun. We do get ion or coronal mass ejections occurring in the chamber. We do get photospheric type of behavior. It looks very much like the photosphere of the sun. We get a corona. And it's okay to take beautiful pictures of these things in, in high definition video with modern technology. But what Sapphire is about is using state-of-the-art technology, mass spectrometers, Langmuir probes, optical spectroscopy, and other types of instruments to go right into the plasma and diagnose the causes of the particular phenomena that we see. So this is cause and effect for those who would be familiar with that principle. But the methodology that we use falls under what's called design of experiments. And that's not a design of an experiment, but it's an extremely disciplined, statistically robust method of diagnosing a variety of variables that contribute to the final phenomena that we see as sapphire, or in the case, if it is true, the sun. So about a year ago, we launched phase one of sapphire, and it was really a proof of concept design and a small bell jar. We limited the power to 1800 watts DC. We believe the power going across the plasma may be around 800 watts DC. But there were changes in the plasma that we did not expect. We went in to do this just to test the instrumentation to see if it could live inside this environment and if we could gather usable data. We exceeded very well in that. The instrumentation will work. But the phenomena that we've seen and we observed in there and what we did measure quite frankly, blew our minds. We uh, observed a much hotter corona than the core. The core, we believe right now, was about 500 degrees Celsius. The plasma, just adjacent to the surface of the core, we believe to be around 3,000 degrees Celsius. We don't see that there's any thermal um, influence in the plasma towards the anode, even though the plasma may be only five or maybe ten thousandths of an inch away from the surface of the anode. So we don't understand why the thermal characteristics of the plasma only goes outward into the chamber and not directly back into the core as well and heat it up, which is interesting because it's similar behavior of the sun. As you go in closer to the sun, it gets colder. And as you go out further from the sun, it gets hotter. Uh, the photosphere of the sun is measured to be around five, six thousand degrees Celsius. The corona of the sun, on the other hand, is about 2 million degrees. And we're seeing very similar behavior in sapphire. Now, when some of these ion cloud would build up around the surface of the anode, they would blow off into the atmosphere of the chamber. Now, if you remember, I said that we limited the power to 1,800 watts in the chamber. But when this power was released, or when these ejections came off the surface, we measured, and we've confirmed with third party, that we measured power release of over 2 million watts. And in some cases, we measured over 10 million watts. Now, that's a lot of power. Now, it didn't last long. We'd say right now we've measured between 50 and 150 to maybe 200 nanoseconds. But it was there. And we don't understand it. We're also getting a copious amount of an atomic mass of three, which we have yet to determine what that is. So we've got a lot of work to do. Now, there's only a few mechanisms or possibilities for that atomic mass of three. And if anyone who's a physicist understands what I'm saying, they'll understand that that's, that's fairly strong talk with regards to things like the possibility of fusion. We are not making a claim for fusion right now, but there's an indication of an atomic mass of three. And we do understand that mass spec that we're using gives us readings and there's certain things that go on in there. But like I said, we've got more work to do. And that's really what phase two is about. So phase two, which will be introduced at the conference, will be showing 
uh, chamber, which is much larger in size. It's actually quite huge. The power that, that we're going to limit to go into the, into the chamber won't be 1,800 watts. It'll be 105,000 watts. And we'll let that energy, as far as current is concerned, impinge on the core. And then we'll start to do measurements. The other thing that we're going to be doing in this chamber, unlike the small bell jar, the way that we're going to be measuring things, we've designed a three-dimensional orbital probe. And what this will allow us to do, it will be analogous to you getting into a spacecraft with a whole bunch of instruments on board and taking a journey down through the corona of the sun, through its photosphere, maybe make an orbit, and then go on and fly back out in your flight path towards the heliopause. And the whole time that we're doing this, we're going to be making measurements. Now, the measurements themselves are for two reasons. Number one, to diagnose the plasma physics that are going on in there, which is, to our knowledge, have never been done to this resolution. And number two, the data that we're getting back, we're working to compare that with the data that's coming back from SDO and from IBAX and so many of the other spacecraft that are up there that are doing these measurements. And right now, what I can tell you, optically, even the basic measurements we're getting back from SAFAR right now, we have not found any disparities between what we're measuring in SAFAR and what we are measuring from the sun. And that's our job. And it's kind of unusual, because normally when you run tests and experiments, you can usually find disparities. But to date, we have not found any. So the team itself is not gravitational, and we're not electric universe team. We were contracted to examine this model and see if the evidence may support or possibly falsify the electric universe model, electric sun model. But as I said, right now to date, over the last, now I guess we're going on to four years, we haven't found anything. So that's fundamentally what SAFIRE is about. Uh, the word SAFIRE is really an acronym and it stands for Stellar Atmospheric Function in Regulation Experiment. So and it's really about the processes and mechanisms by which these particular phenomena can occur. So we're examining not origins, we're not examining what may happen in the future, we're examining these processes and these phenomena right now, as they exist right now.